My name is Merapelo Litebele. I am a host of this program called Selalelo. Through this program, we are trying to get Africans talking about things that are of mutual interest to them and trying to link up Africans with other Africans in the diaspora, the continental United States, the Caribbean islands, and anywhere where Africans may be. Today, I am hosting some ladies from different countries in Africa, and we're going to discuss patriarchy, gender relations, and all things that relate to that topic and to see how this topic relates to the lives we live in the 21st century Africa. Welcome, ladies. You may introduce yourselves. Thank you, Mirabello. Uh, my name is Cindy So, and I'll be representing Zimbabwe. My name is Nancy Warui. I'll be representing Kenya. Good evening. My name is Catherine. I'll be representing Uganda. My name is Barbara. I'm representing Botswana. So, ladies, do you feel that women have achieved equality you know, we have been crying about equality of the genders for a very long time. Do you think that women desire equality and do, or do you think they have actually achieved it and there's nothing else to talk about? I think we have achieved much, but we haven't gotten where we want to be. Women have the desire for more, but have been held back by the society, the community, the, the, the tradition. The tradition has been sitting on a women for a very long time. And uh, by the looks of things, it looks like the majority of women have pulled through and have tried their best, but we still have a long way to go. Yes. I don't think we have reached equality yet. We are definitely strides further than we were during the 50s or the 60s, but women in terms of representation, let me use Uganda as an example, you'll find that in politics, maybe we have about 39% representation of women. So we are aiming towards more like 50 or 60, even probably higher than men. So I don't think we've reached equality. And then you also find in terms of jobs, I may be doing a sa the same job as a man, but you will find that he's better paid than I am. So I don't think that's equality. And then also in the workplace, the men tend to be respected more. And even when it comes to elections, you'll find even though the population may be majority female, we're still voting for the men. So I don't think equality has been reached. And I think even us as women, what are we doing? Are we helping this patriarchal society continue? I think coming from the same region of East Africa, probably I would say we go through the same challenges. For example, like have we achieved equality? No. Are we almost there? Far from being there. The reason being, this is 2024, yet we had our general elections last year of 290 members of parliament, only 29 women were able to get into the parliament. That is not even a quota. It is so ridiculous. Yet, women, we had the highest population. So, like, like Catherine is saying, we are not yet there. We have the power. If probably we came together as women and spoke in one voice, there's so much we can be able to achieve. But also culturally, just like everybody, uh, every other African country, we all suffer from the same things. The social norm. We are so limited as a woman because of the social status. Woman, you're not allowed to do so much. You're actually so limited. Things like even education alone. A girl child will be deemed like, I would rather educate my son better than educate my own daughter. At this era, some of the communities in Kenya, they still value a woman like, you know, like you know, you don't deserve it. Yet, we should have the equal opportunity. Is the government doing something about it? Yes. Uh, do we see other organizations coming together to do something about it? Yes. Are we yet yet there? No. Is there hope? There's a lot of hope we can get. I think the other ladies, Kathy and Nancy, they've already mentioned when it comes to the political sphere, you find that our parliament is full of men. It's male dominated. And our population, according to the census, we've got more women than men. Uh, you see, there's a gap somewhere. You know, we are not recognized. It's always the men. And I think all this is derived from the traditional norms where a man has always been told to be the head. We might not say it out, but we feel it in our workplaces. We feel it in the environment, you know, the practices, culture traditionally, you find that women are always disadvantaged. Okay, like for example, I'm talking from our tradition here in Botswana. The lady is being paid lobola. Why can't be the women be the first one to receive that lobola? You find that there's a quota out there and the money will be shown to the women or the cows will be shown to the women after they've been accepted.
admired and appreciated by the men. Ours is to just hululas just behind the men, you know. So to me, that gap, I'm talking of the traditional one. In the offices, yes, we are striving, as I'm saying. A lot of women, you find that we push our ways to be in a particular position at our workplaces and everything, but we are always dominated by men. So, um, ladies, what do you think it is about us as a gender that makes us unequal to men? Why do you think that the men in all the cultures, it doesn't matter whether you're talking about the Western culture or the Eastern cultures or the African cultures, the men have always been dominant. So what do you think it is about the men that make them become the default leaders over the women? What is there something wrong with us? Did we do something what is it? We didn't do anything wrong at all. I think by nature, either from the Western, Eastern, whichever part of the world you're coming from, being taught that a woman has to submit to a man, number one. And number two, we have been taught that a woman has to stay at home and take care of the family and take care of the kids while the men go out to work and provide. We have been taught that a man is the provider. But I think most of us women have realized that men have failed us dismally when it comes to provision. Instead of providing, they have manipulated the system. A man, instead of going out and bringing provision home, they will waste it. And at the end of the day, you find that the kids and the, the wife are suffering. They're hungry. They don't have food. They don't have clothes. Their school fees is not paid. Things are not adding up because someone makes decisions all by themselves and they don't include you as a wife because they are, you are deemed a child when you're at home. It has suppressed us down. Okay. Okay, let me talk from a rural perspective in Uganda. For instance, they are taught from a young age that the man is the head of the home and the lady has to submit. So this is what you see growing up. You see that the father is in charge. He's the boss of the home. Whatever he says goes, the mother has to just submit to everything that he says. So there's no questioning. You don't ask any questions. So a lady grows up knowing that, you know, whatever a man says, I must conform. So a lot of the time your voice is lost. You feel like I don't have to challenge any man, regardless of who he is, if he's your uncle, if he's the teacher, as long as he's male, we don't challenge him. So we grow up with those soft qualities. And if for any instance you try and speak as a woman, you're told you're not being feminine. So somehow a part of you feels like if my voice is loud, am I being masculine? Am I changing the stereotypical view of what a lady should be like. So yeah, very docile, very submissive, very. But what I've loved in the urban society, there's a lot of women who are now challenging the status quo. They're like, you know what? We can speak out. And they're called feminists, but it's okay. We're allowed to speak out. We're in a new generation. We're in a new dispensation. So they are like, no, that was our parents' age. Now this is the time for us to shine. And I've seen a lot of women now coming out and helping empower these rural communities that they can speak out. So there is a bit of progressive change in the viewpoints of how a woman was and how they can become slowly. From a very young age and do across different um, times, all it has always been known, it's a man's world. So a young boy will grow knowing this is a man's world. The man will rule. The man will almost get away with anything he does. Nobody should question him. And since it came maybe from our four grandfathers, it went on to the grandfather, to the father, to the son, it is a whole generation of things. And once they grow up with that kind of mentality, they feel that they dominate in every area. And us as women, we don't have a voice. And thing, we can see the shift now, the result of shifts. We see things happening, like we had the International Women's Day, and it was uh, advocating for equality. We could see the voices that were being put across and we are speaking in one voice. So I feel like there's nothing wrong we have done as women. It's just the status quo or just how we fought things. Like it's a man's wild thing. It's about him. He is the leader. He's everything. Yet we know it doesn't have to be like that. So we have now also to try and tune our daughters. You know, the, the generations coming down as they're coming up, we also tell them, you know what? 
this can be challenged. It doesn't have to be the way we found it. It can change as time goes. And I, we, we thank God we can see the shift. We have always been taught, like, you know, the woman came after the man, which is, we honor that. But that alone also is taken uh, out of context. Like, I cannot challenge anything because I am the head. You are just part of me, the rib, just a small part of my body, you know. So when all that is put together, it brings this whole concept of the man feeling, I am the head and, and I cannot be equal. We can never be equal. I've always been ahead of you. We have always known men to be the providers. But for some reasons, as years go by, you find that the ladies are more providers than men. And one thing which I notice is gender inequality. Yes, the ladies in town have tried to make sure that their voices are heard. But what about the rural counterparts? What about our mothers in the rural? You'll go home with your husband today. My mother will make, want to know whether my husband is eaten, whether my husband is bathed with hot water. You know, it's still there. How are we going to remove that from our traditional mothers? And we might practice it here in the um, urban areas, but we all have this uh, rural background traditionally where you will, your parent can even call you aside and tell you that you are embarrassing them. I think that men, that's where they get this thing that they are, you know, it starts from far. I think as much as we are fighting for it, let's go back to the root cause, which is in our villages. Um, everybody in the world, for some strange reason, see the men as providers. But I have a lot of interest in African history, especially Zona history. Okay. And I have found out that the women have always been the providers. The women have always been doing the work. Sometimes when I'm just debating with my friends, this comes up and I'm like, but guys, how do you expect the men to be the providers if our culture is saying something different. Where did we get that thing from? I'm just saying that to uh, bring forth another point. And that point is that in the Sotswana culture, we have what we call kota. There are many different types of kotas. They are all built along the same model. <clears throat> and it starts within your family group where you have a family kota, you have a ward kota, you have a village kota, like that, like that. And I have always seen that this quarter is where everything was happening. And did you know that it was only in the 70s, in 1977, if I'm not mistaken, when women were allowed for the first time to get into the quota meeting. They were never allowed before then. It took 11 years after our independence to actually allow women to sit in the deliberations of a quota meeting. But the quota is the place where the rules were made. So which shows me that in this culture, the rules were made by the men at the exclusion of the women. And so today we find ourselves kind of struggling with reconciling how, because the men will say, no, you, you can come to the quota. But do you see the practices that they are observing come from before women were ever allowed in the quota a mere 40, 40 years ago? I'm just throwing this in there to see what your views are. Also to check if you have a similar setup, maybe in Uganda, in Kenya, to see how did the dominance of men manifest? Where was it coming from? Do you have quota systems and things like that? Can I just chip in there? Um, sure. You know, I'm... Um born from South Africa as well. My mother is Zulu. And I find the Zulu men are more dominating. They are the rulers. Just like the quota, there is such a thing. I think this quota thing where main decisions are made in the quota by the men, it runs in all our African cultures, if I'm not wrong. What I seen happening in Zululand, I see it happening in Botswana where I'm married, where I'm a citizen now. I see it happening in Zimbabwe, where my dad comes from. I find that it's just the same. Yeah, so in Uganda we have the we do have the clan system. So each group is has different clans and then that clan has a a leader or an elder. So they are predominantly men. I've never, honestly, maybe I stand corrected, ever heard at any point having a female clan leader. So definitely power has always originated from men. In Kenya, we have about 42 different tribes, but you'll be shocked to notice one thing that is so similar in all those 42 different tribes. They have their way of governing, like traditionally they used to do it the same way almost. 
the shocking thing is no woman could become a leader. They're not allowed to go for those meetings. So it is dominantly the same thing. Now let me move on to a different question. So have you ever personally been, have you ever felt discriminated against because you're a woman ever? All the time, all the time, everywhere. It doesn't matter where you are. I mean, including our workplaces where basically we we lead and we have positions high authority we there are times when you are belittled just because you're a woman you are told okay no can you let mr so and so do this as if you you said you can't do it as if you 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 are a weakling we we it, it happens all around yes i have i have gone through that unfortunately it's more of a system of if you want to be promoted then meet me in my bedroom that's how you're going to be promoted. So that sexual favor thing seems to be have an innuendo type of vibe where if you want to rise, sleep with me. And that is not fair. That really is not fair. So that's what I've been through. And fortunately, I didn't succumb because I didn't want to set a standard for if you do it once, then maybe for life, I would have to be doing that. I think we've all gone through it as a woman. I remember for me, it was very, it was hurtful because I got a promotion and the word that went around is she did not deserve it, but because she's beautiful, she must have been sleeping with her boss. Yet you have earned it. You've worked hard for it. Then the promotion, I became the HR manager. And of course, I'm there now making policies, trying to implement. And of course, I could see the gender parity. Like if it's market director and the finance director, we're in the same level, they're the same level. But because the marketing director is a lady, her salary scale is so low. And when I try to question why there's that salary parity, like there are a lot of differences. We could be you no know, Nancy, some of these things you cannot question. You know, I'm not supposed to question because they've come from the head office. It's already something like it's a written code. Nobody should question it. The man is the provider. The woman is not a provider. So why should they have this equal salary? So it, I've seen it. I've experienced it. Stay with me. Um, I felt it when my daughter got pregnant. And there wasn't a marriage, but the guy had to be charged. You know, the normal damages, whatever. I, I actually asked my husband that why was I left out in talking? Because I carried this girl nine months. I mm -hmm. feel that I should have a contribution you know, to that. And he kept on telling me, you know, you want to change things. This is all about men. It's the fathers who decide. But guys, who carried this girl for nine months? Which brings me to a very related uh, topic to what you just said, Barbara. I think our biggest problem resides in the bride prize, ladies. No matter how we may try to sweeten the words or try to make them sound nicer. I, I, I also understand its importance, but I'm beginning to see it for what it really is. It is a sale. I want us to look at it from that perspective. Do you see a dowry, bride price, whatever you call it, as a purchase of a bride? I would say that, yes, it's a purchase of a bride because I've heard of stories where if the bride does not match to the market value you have given, she is returned with her cow. So if it wasn't a purchase, why would you return it? No, I, I totally agree with what you said. And in this case, the man is the buyer, mm -hmm. which is very sad because the woman becomes a property. We have a tribe in Kenya right now. As long as you're married, if your husband dies, you don't have a choice. You're automatically given to the brother. You have to be married by the brother or in that clan automatically. Reason B. They paid for you the bride price. You belong to that clan. So as a woman, whether you like it or not, you don't have a choice. You don't have a say in it. So for me, when I look at it, it's a sale. The woman becomes like a property. And then I also hate it because it has brought all these issues, like even the gender violence, because the man will feel, I have owned you. I own you. I got married as well. And my parents were paid. I think from the root of this bride price, this is my thinking, a person that might have started this thing might have started it with a good mind of saying, this is a token of appreciation of saying thank you to the parents that have given me, to these people that have given me a wife. But because of male people just being dominant in everything, they decided to manipulate this to their advantage. 
to say, well, it's not a thank you anymore. It's a it, it, it's a payment. I have bought you with money. I have um, I've had um, most people in, in my culture whereby if you get married and and um, the dowry is not paid, um, the aunties of the, of the, the the your your husband's sisters they would always you know tease you like you you're like a knife. We borrowed you. We can take you back because you know you're you're just like a knife or you're like a spoon or a plate, we, we borrowed you because you you nothing was paid for you. They have manipulated into a, 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 an evil thing that really degrades a woman into nothing. As we are all talking ladies, we are all in the same pool. Only that you find that it's some with some nations is more forceful. Like Nancy spoke of being forced to be given to the brother. I know that traditionally in, with my mother said the Zulus, which I believe, Cindy, if I'm not wrong, in Zimbabwe, you are given to the brother, whoever is still alive. So this is just an African uh, traditional thing. Also, Cindy, this Lobola thing, uh, which Mirabolo says that it all starts there. Now it has even become monetary term. It used to be cows. Now cows are valued, you know, they first go to the value to find out how much is a, a cow. And then, you are, you know, you are paid a, a, according to how much is the value of a cow. If a cow is 5,000, if it's 10 cows, it's 50,000. You know, I know my brother got married in the Eastern Cape. We're told that the lady is valued at 200 and each cow was 10,000 rand. Oh my God. Which meant my brother paying 2,000, I mean, 200,000 uh, rands, you know, as a bride. Yes, to me is to say thank you that you have given us a woman uh, who will increase our nation. Because obviously the woman is there to multiply, you know, you get pregnant, you get pregnant, you get pregnant. To me, I'm thinking that price is to say thank you because someone will generate the nation. Let me tell you something, the most humiliating thing that I have heard, uh, that back in the day when there was a divorce, when the man didn't want a woman who, because she, she, she wasn't producing any offspring, they would return her to her home on a sled or a sledge, you know, and they would <laughs> attach a, a huge thorn uh, branch at the back of the sledge so that it can erase even her footsteps to show that she, like she had never even came to your, to your home. So I'm just wondering if you ladies have something that shows the humiliation that a woman who, who was barren was subjected to. Have you ever had anything, you know, culturally, I'm not talking about modern things back in the day. Have you heard anything? There's quite a lot of stories on that one. Um, the one I know is, is of my auntie who, whom the husband was told to go and look for another woman and she doesn't have a say in it because she can't produce because the the family the clan has to grow and if she can't um grow the clan or grow the family then she has no say in whatever the husband does and whether she the, the husband goes out there and brings an sti or a std or aids or whatever she still doesn't have a say on it because she can't give birth to any kids do you really think that women and men can be equal? Maybe we are asking for something impossible. We are not asking for anything impossible. It is possible. It is doable. There's just maybe, let me put it like this, 1% of men out there that have tried, that have tried to, 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 to make us equal. Um, I have um, my, my biological sister. She had met the most beautiful soul who would do anything do laundry, cook, and do house chores for her. And she, she'll be lying on the bed, doing, talking to her. You know, they'll, they'll be talking. And he'll be busy cooking while she's sitting, doing absolutely nothing. And from there, he will dish and bring the food. Honey, let's eat. And, you know, they, they, there's 1% of men that are there that have tried. I believe it's doable. <laughs> Sorry, I'm laughing, honestly. Cindy... <laughs> I understand it's doable that's between mm. the two people if i can tell <laughs> you this one of the relatives find this man busy in the kitchen doing the kitchen they will just say you gave him something in order yeah, for him you to bewitched him <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but this man he has been bewitched in africa there's no man who does that what Mi mirabello is saying that is this doable that one day we can be equal with men i'm saying uh, in towns, I know women are fighting that. But yeah. with me, if we are just doing it in town, guys, what's happening out there? So let's yeah, touch base with where we come from. 
if we manage to start there, I feel that we can get somewhere. But if we're just doing it, us here, we are in technology, we are on Zoom now, and those ladies who are in a kingle or something in the villages, let, let's go to these quarters and try to convince it. I was going to say, if you see some women, what happens, especially in the rural areas, when the husband is alive, he's taking care of her in in terms of the monetary. But what happens when he leaves, when he dies and what? And then she's stranded. So for mm. me, it would be important for ladies to also realize that they can make a, a living and also earn for themselves and also have an identity for themselves. Because I feel... If you do not contribute to having a purpose away from the home, there's a part of you that just feels like you haven't really lived and you haven't really fulfilled something. So we we are beyond our homes. I believe we are beyond our homes and we we can add value. I've seen a lot of women projects. When women come, there's something about women getting involved. They seem to get a lot done. A lot done. Instead of just talking, 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 they get to action. They can multitask. Women can achieve. And I'm looking forward to the time when we are given that power. Yeah. Uh, there's no right or wrong answer on this. Are we equal? No, we are not. We are not. Realistically speaking, we are not equal. And as a Christian, it has also like tuned our minds to respect the fact that I'm supposed to be to submit to my husband. That said, we are working hard towards equality. It's the best thing that can happen to our girl child. But we have a lot of work to do. There's a lot of empowerment to be done. Okay, now I'm going to switch gears a little bit. Um, I'm just interested in knowing, uh, as women living in Botswana, do you feel safe walking around the street? Do you have any fear of crime? Are you worried that somebody's going to hurt you? All the time. I, 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 I put curfew all the time. Like, uh, I have to be home. Six o'clock, I'm home. If I have to go out after six, I have to go with a group of people or someone, a male person or someone. I, I can't, I don't feel safe being out alone after hours. Um, you know, I've been running in my neighborhood in the mornings, five o'clock, got at five. But then I noticed that there's a lot of women being attacked by male if they walk around that time. So that makes us not say. And the attack is not from a woman. There's no woman who there's no woman who I've heard that has been attacked by a woman, you know. Mm. So all our unsafeness, all our unsafety thinking is all around the men. Those are the people who will attack us in any form. So really to me, as a woman to be out in a street alone, even at night, let's say uh, Mirabello, you are staying four or five houses away and I don't feel like sleeping and I feel like, hey, let me go to Mirabello's house. I don't feel safe to go alone because the picture is a man is going to attack me. I'm there to see mm. a woman attacking me. I'm not scared. Of, I yeah. can meet another woman. I'll feel even more safer. So definitely we are unsafe. We don't feel safe. I thought I was the only one. Yes. No, we are unsafe. I've, it has happened to me. I've been attacked <laughs> two, three times by men in a way that I'm also very aware now of my surrounding. Just like her, I used to go for jogging in the mornings. But because nowadays it's a bit dark because winter is coming, I've even stopped unless I do it later in the evening when there are a lot of people on the road. So it's also limiting. Mm -hmm. You can't go somewhere alone, especially if you're a woman driving, because you always are target if you're a bit late. So just like Sidi have said, you have to put yourself a curfew, give yourself a curfew. So mm -hmm. I don't feel safe at all. At all, I don't. And back in Kenya, it's 10 times worse because the population is high and limited opportunity. The crime rate is so high, so it's no different. I actually have an incident that happened a few weeks ago. I was entering my car and there was a man next to my car who claims that I made scratches on his car. So fortunately, my car door locked because the man now started hitting across my car and tr was trying to force my door open and my daughter was in the car with me and she was getting so nervous and she was getting so scared. But I just, I'm so thankful that at least my door automatically locked because I'm asking myself, if it hadn't done that, what was this man going to, to do to me? You know, and I, you know that mama bear tendency where you will protect your young. I fear for what I would have done to that man because in your anger, especially as a mom, when you're with your 
come. You can do anything. And the the mm. the the weird thing about me is in adrenaline, I fear for what I'll do in adrenaline. I'll deal with the cops later. <laughs> yeah. So I yeah. I just yeah. think I'm thankful that I was protected and nothing happened. And the good thing that I saw is the people who he was with were very shocked because they're just asking themselves, what is his problem? I did mm. not cause a commotion. So fortunately, I kudos to his to his male friends because they looked at him like, are you serious? Did you really have to do that? So there are some good men still out there who need to call their brothers out. Yeah. Tell me, do you feel do you feel unsafe out in the streets or in the home or both? Just a, like 10 seconds each. Both everywhere, because I've been attacked at home when I was home. You know, when they came home, they they took our stuff and we were home. We they doors closed, everything closed, but they forced open everything. Everywhere we are not safe. Everywhere we are not safe. I've also been like in my house. It has been uh, like two times on the roads, three times. So everywhere, not safe at all. I'm going to get more. I'm um, not, not safe as well. We had to install some serious burglar bars that look like a prison cell now. And we also had to get dogs because we kept on getting incidences. And yeah. I think we are not safe at all, ladies, because... You find that if you are sleeping alone, or even if we are, we are with kids, you just feel, I cannot sleep without putting on the alarm. You know, we always have to sleep with this alarm. Somehow, I don't know whether it really doesn't help because it has happened to me with the alarm. They managed to break in, take my bag from my bedroom and go away. The time the, the alarm monitoring people arrive, the guys are gone because they are not at my doorstep outside waiting to see who is coming into my house. They have to drive from a certain place. That's, that's their excuse. So with those alarms, just to say at least something will make noise, you know, to alert somebody. But we are still not safe with those alarms. Yeah. So now can tell I me. say something? Okay, sure. Go ahead. Um, When you call, if you call the cops, we've also had incidences where they say, come and collect us. Or we don't have a car, you know, so you're just wondering, hello, security systems and all of that. Okay, now I just want to talk about something to sort of like present a concept to you and have you react to it. And if you can each just, you know, limit your comments to one minute each so that we can wrap up nicely so that I don't take much of your time. Um, Here's a theory. I'm sure other people, excuse me. I'm sure that many people ha may have advanced it at different times for different reasons, but it's something that I thought of on my own, having explored and examined my own culture, okay? First of all, it started off with when I realized that Botswana women have always been doing the bulk of the work. In order for a family to subsist, to exist or even subsist, it's through the efforts of the woman more than that of the man. The woman had to build the house. She had to cook. She had to go get the firewood. She had to make um, cooking pots from clay, you name it, everything was uh, the lot of a woman. And then the other thing, then from there, when you, you reached a certain age, in fact, you had no choice in who you were going to marry because we had arranged marriages in the past. In order for you, your father is the one who decided with the other men who he's going to marry you off to, right? And then he took payment for you. And in your family life as a wife, you know, you had no say in the decision making of the home and all these other things that we, we all, we've been talking about that we all know. And because I, I work uh, with this non-governmental organization called the Movement in Omaha for Racial Equity, I became more aware of racial issues. Because if you are in Africa, if you are in Botswana, there is no racism anywhere because we're just <laughs> Africans. The majority of us are just Black people around each other, right? Now, mm -hmm. becoming more versed and, and you know exposed to issues of racism, I have come to realize that when you look at what happened during slavery, it's almost the same thing as what happens in an African marriage situation. So there are also other African cultures where women were acquired in this very strange way, way where a man could just grab you from the street and then send a word out to your parents to say, I'm marrying your daughter or whatever. But 
You know what I'm saying? So when you look at how were slaves acquired, they were raided for and they were grabbed from the street. Some of them were sold. And all they did was all this um, domestic labor. They provided domestic labor, agricultural labor with no pay, which is exactly the same thing that ha that a woman goes through. So I'm wondering mm -hmm. if you guys, are you aware of this thing? Have you ever heard it before? And what do you think of it? I understand that now we marry for love. There's an element of love now. I cannot say all oh, we were grabbed from the streets or anything. No, that's not what I'm saying. But we know that there are still some societies, even in Botswana, where young girls don't go to school. We know who we don't want to sound like we are denigrating any you know, particular sub subgroup or whatever. But we know that it's ha happening even right here in Botswana. So where young girls are denied the right to go to school, they are married. Before then, yeah. they they go around selling little things on the street. And it's like nobody cares. And then we know that as soon as you become <clears throat> a wife, even if you are unmarried, if you remain with in your family home unmarried, what's going to happen to you is the, the, the responsibility of taking care of your aging parents or your aged parents falls on you. Nobody pays you for that. Uh, when you're a young girl, suppose you, you get pregnant at 18, for instance. It means you have to stay at home with your child until they are old enough to go to school, by which time you have lost all opportunities for training and this and that. Do you see, I believe that's how women get left behind. But more than that, I really want us to talk about how a marriage in a very, very traditional, not, not what we guys are doing, uh, in a very traditional setup is... There's very little difference between it and slavery. Am I crazy for saying that or even thinking that? There's no difference at all. You said there's very little. I say there's no difference. It's, it's the same as slavery. Mm. Because when we grew up, we, we, I'm from a very big family. Like our family was more like a community. My, my grandfather um, was a traditional doctor and had three daughters and three sons. And the three sons were married to all of them, two women each. And these women had all kids and we were just like a, a clan, a very big community. And um, in all of this, all the men were dominating and all the men were putting rules in order and all the rules had to be followed by the wives, by the kids, by our aunties, by every single woman. It didn't matter whether the woman was older than the man who's putting rules down or not, but rules were to be followed. And if they were not followed, there were going to be serious consequences or over that and um my two aunties were not um they did not have a choice in who they got married they were handed over the other one was handed to a very old man because that old man was rich so they said no this old man will take care of our daughter so they handed her over to the old man she had no say she had no choice she just went and she, that was it that was the end of of, of her chapter in life Anybody wants to jump um, in? Yes, uh, let me jump in quickly, Mirabello. I think if we're looking at it, not talking of ourselves, of course, why not ourselves? Because we are these women who the men will shush them out because they know we provide. That's the only reason what makes these men in our houses keep quiet, because yeah. they know that without this woman, she covers 75% uh, of the life in this house. It's just this thing that he's got no choice. He just has to shush his mouth. But if they were yeah. given the chance, we could be all living our great grannies type of way of marriages in our houses. We must yeah. thank God for the education we have managed and all. I think in brief, definitely that marriage is just as good as slavery because you work, you iron for the man, make sure that his shoes are at the doorstep before he goes to work. But where, these days I'm also making sure that my shoes are at my doorstep and my iron is ready for, you know, what I can do the least is to make sure that there's an iron in the bedroom so that the man can wake up and iron his and while I iron mine. And he can't say much. Yeah, I, yeah. yeah, I think that's what I, I totally agree with you there. The respect that we are getting, the equality that we think we think we are getting comes from the fact that we provide and they can see that we play a big role in provision. They can lay back and, and I know some, some women who, who work and, and their husbands don't work. You know, they these women wake up in the morning going to work, leaving their men at home. And it looks like they're living happily ever after, but that's not it. It's sugar coated into the woman providing and the men just sitting there enjoying luxury that is being provided by the woman. In our village, the ladies used to serve the man on her knees. So it's like she postures herself as if he's this king and 
on a silver tray and things like that. So that to me is like you have a master and it's not done in love. It's more out of, I am serving you. And so, yeah, so that's still, I think to this day, it still continues in some places, but like, Barbara was saying in the urban areas, women are woke, so probably not there, but in the rural areas, they're still expected to do that. They wake up earliest, maybe four or five o'clock in the morning, they wake up and water has to be done. Then there's a kitchen that they used to be in, which was very smoky. And you can imagine the suit that they're busy coughing out. And whether you're sick or not, you must serve your husband. There was no time for you to say, oh, my back is aching or anything like that. You are at all times just to serve him. If you're ever sick, there was no, the man is not even going to do anything for you. You probably now say, you know what, if you're not good for anything, next week woman can come in so you always had to just see what you could do no choice no questions just continue day in day out January to December and sure I can imagine I honestly don't even want to imagine what type of lifestyle do you know that I actually grew up serving my father in a tray and kneeling down and doing all that I don't even know (laughs) when I stopped (laughs) me too (laughs) oh my goodness did you feel like that was slavery no, 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 no. My dad used to cook for us. My dad was kind of a modern father. So, but, but I had to do that. In fact, I had to come with the water first to wash his hands before and kneel down. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, I want us to talk about the, 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 the slavery element. I, I didn't really get it coming out from you, especially uh, Miss, is it Kathy and Nancy? Do you think that, no, if you feel free to, you know, to disagree. Oh, no, no, actually, I call it modern slavery. Modern slavery. Because mm-hmm. just like basically you're saying, this African culture, it cuts across. It doesn't matter which country you come from. Mm-hmm. Because just like yeah. Catherine is saying, she's from East African religion, just like where I come from. Mm-hmm. Basically the same thing. But just mm-hmm. like you're saying, from, you know, traditionally, it has always been like that. It doesn't matter which country you come from, as long as it's an Afri- in Africa, it was like that enslavement oh there was something called wife capture it's almost like what you described so there could be young girls in the in the village and then they're spotted by whoever and then they're taken so you just find a family will just find that their their daughter is missing they were not told where she is but you would assume that something has happened to her and eventually you just give up but wife capture was a very common issue there in in our villages and then also marrying off at a very 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 young age so definitely you don't even have a choice in whether you're getting married by 13 14 they call it um child marriage so that was also very common you'd find that you're just groomed into marriage there was no other opportunity you just knew that 13, 14, I have no say. And like someone has said, no matter the age of the man, you just had to go with whoever you were, were supposed to go with. There was no choice like in our day and age where you're like, oh, he looks hot. So yeah. yeah. (laughs) Do you think that the African family is disintegrating? Is it being destroyed? Because we don't have colonialism or apartheid anymore. Who is destroying the African family structure? Modernization. (laughs) Because, like, there's, um, if you do not have a culture, you are lost. Like, you are lost. And there's this thing now, especially for the young people are being told, because they don't know the culture, they are lost. So there's that mindset that modernization has come to kill the culture, that has neutralized everything, has made the girl shout more aware of who she is, has made us now see things beyond. That's why now they're saying, because it's killing the culture, like, you know, the norms are being broken. Now, I feel that is where now all this the equation is changing. I think westernization and definitely the media, social media and the movies we're watching. And yes, just being exposed to other environments, especially from the States, Europe and that. So uh, there's a lot of promotion in my careerism where people are now most women are now choosing that I'd rather have a career than carry a baby some people are even saying I don't even want to have kids I want my body to look a certain way I don't want my boobs to be saggy so now I'm choosing myself and there's that 
that breakdown in I don't have to have kids. I have a choice. Take it or leave it, parents. You know, if you want grandbabies, look to somebody else or I will buy them if I want to. So there's that modernization, like she said, and the westernization. So we don't have to have babies ourselves. We can just buy them online if we want. Are you telling me that us, is it us or we, <laughs> fighting for equality is causing the breakdown of our culture? Like, I'm not saying it's good or bad. Are we doing it? Are we the ones killing it all? Because when we have the, the freedoms that we want, when we have the equality that we desire, it means we're going to change everything. It's Definitely. Going to change Definitely. I was actually going to just say that after the ladies, that the topic which we are discussing now, is the one which is making us lose the culture. And why we're having this topic? Because we've been educated. You know, we've yeah. learned from wherever. We've traveled, we've been all over, we've mingled, we've missed. If I can tell you, uh, my grandmother would even tell you that, oh, you know, I wish I can find you white husbands so that you don't slave like, you know. <laughs> so imagine this modernized grandmother is also. So we believe this is the white man, but we are copying some culture. You know, mm -hmm. but as I'm saying this gender, we are discovering ourselves, we are discovering this inequality. You know, it's it's something we're talking about, but there is a force behind it. There is something which is driving all this discussion. You know, I don't necessarily definitely. think that. Oh, go ahead. I just, I just wanted to say definitely totally agree with um, Barbara that there, there is a force behind it. Like, you know, when you you put a carrot in a stick and you put it in front of the donkey and the, the donkey keeps on going, like going, wanting to eat that carrot, but not realizing that it is pulling. It, you see, this is exactly what happened. Like we were put in a situation whereby we were enticed to say, you know, if you are independent and strong and you are a woman, you are a go-getter, you know, then you are, you're good, you're beautiful in that. But nothing was said about what you're going to lose in the process of getting what you want, in the process of going where you want, in the process of uh, finding yourself. So there's a catch in it, but someone is drive, definitely driving it. And we love who we are becoming as women. We love what we are finding about ourselves. But I don't know if we are aware that in the process, we are losing something. Yeah, I, um, I'm just trying to see, I'm thinking about this as we are talking and listening to you ladies. But you see, nobody has to lose. If we have, this is what I think, if we have equality in the in the home between, I get it, we want to, to retain families. We're not saying, let's not just, let's all not get married. That's not what we're saying. And let's not all have, you know, children out of wedlock. Because I feel like, not. I'm not saying this to denigrate anybody, but if we, if you have children uh, out of wedlock, it's almost like you're giving the men a pass to not, take care of the child because we know that given a chance, the men will run, right? So in mm. my view, uninformed with anything scientific, just observing how the African culture is. I think maybe if I'm married, it's better because the husband is there. You know how even when your children t become teenagers, they become rebellious. At least you have somebody to help you scare them straight sometimes even, you know? So there's no need. I mean, the only people, the only people who are losing anything is the men because they're losing privilege, which is not a bad thing. I don't think we should feel bad about demanding equal rights and justice. Like, who is it? Was it uh, Peter Torch who said that? You, you see what I'm saying? I mean, there is no need for the African culture or society to disintegrate because women have equality. We just have to shift the, 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 the levers of uh, power just a little so that we share... And you know, the funniest thing is mo the majority of the times when women talk about equality, they are basically saying there's absolutely no reason for us to be to be to be collapsing the society just because we want equality. The majority of the times women are asking for a little help around the home more than anything. Men and women uh, shared the power to make decisions in the home. What can go wrong in that family? That family will advance more than collapse. You know what I'm saying? So I don't think we should worry about that as much. Um it's been a beautiful conversation. I know that we are over the time that we had agreed. 
So maybe we should just end it. Each one of you can just give us uh, that closing remarks and then maybe we can talk again soon. I think we can do that again. It, it was so it was such an enlightening evening and so delightful to have you ladies with us. But just to add a small point on what you have said, I think there is no harm with us fighting for equality. I'm just going to give a small example. If you look at Rwanda, it is one of the best countries today to live in Africa. Rwanda has the highest number of women in power especially in parliament. What does that tell you? It will translate to the policies that are being passed in that country. You can see the governing is so different. It has a different shift because of the power of women in parliament. So when women, we also agree to be bold enough and to take positions in the power and we run with it, we can make a whole lot difference. And we don't have to lose anything like you said. We don't have to lose our culture. We can still be women, like I can be able to separate. If I'm home, I'm home. This is where my home is. And when I'm at work, I can still wear my title. And we're able to multitask. We are able, God has given us that ability. So I think if we come together as women and we champion for empowerment and we run with it, we'll make a whole lot of difference. Thank you. Uh, it was nice chatting together and as we we're chatting all what i noticed is we're all saying the same thing is happening to each one of us regardless of where we come from you know that's the other nice funny part about us africans you know so i know that we need that equality with men especially when it comes to You've mentioned the seats in parliament, you know, that Rwanda is already progressing. I think this women brain, if maybe we could go 50-50, not that we don't have the population. We do have the populations, only that we've never been given the chance to be on the upper hand of anything. So let's keep, there are so many groups of women out there who are discussing the same thing, like what we have already started. Uh, let's keep talking about it. One day, all these groups together, one voice will be heard from women and the change will definitely be there. Woman. Now we're too. <laughs> oh boy, I love this. I love this. Um, it's good to, I like the way you put it, Barbara, that you know what, is, we are the Bantu speaking, you know, speaking one language and standing in the gap to say, women, we can do this. Let's go for this. But at the same time, we can still maintain our culture and be strong with it and love our culture and love where we are coming from while standing for who we are and believing in ourselves and equipping our young kids, girl child to stand up for themselves as well. Because if we don't do it now, we will they will never be able to catch up. For me, it's been amazing to see ladies that are wives, they are working, they're able to take care of the kids. Some of them have even gone back to school at weird and wonderful ages. They've got masters now, they've got PhDs. And despite everything that they're going through, they've been able to rise above the challenges. So I'm looking forward to the opportunity for women to just be in their positions on merit, not just because they're women, but because they deserve to be there. And if there's a male counterpart, let us let us challenge each other. Let us be able to, to work in the same sphere. And obviously women will definitely be able to show that we can. We are able. Yeah. We haven't had as much time as they have, but can you see how much we have achieved with a little time that we've been exposed to the same platform? as men so can you imagine if we're able to just get that 51 49 yeah mm -hmm. okay um we've come to the end of this program as i've previously mentioned we are sponsored by movement in omaha for racial equity it's been an absolute pleasure ladies loving having you here hearing your voices it sounds like all my personalities came out to play all at once <laughs> so <laughs> This program will be hosted on the MORE website. Um, I'll share it with you and also on the YouTube channel. And I look forward to expounding more, uh, talking more about how we can link up with other women in the diaspora, other African women, and, you know, enhancing bonds, standing up together with one voice and seeing how we can help ourselves and our children for the sake of Africa's future. Thank you.